So I want to welcome everybody to today's NCN webinar, and we're honored to have with us um, U.S. Rural Development Undersecretary Sochil Torres Small, and then at 1:30, U.S. Representative Sharice Davids will be joining us. And then we're also honored to have the leading voices in the field about the 502 program and the demonstration project, including the South Dakota Home Ownership Coalition members Tani Brunch, Joanna Donahoe, Stephanie Provost, and Lakota Vogel. Uh, they were um, the pilot program. And this highly successful demonstration project for the USDA 502 Home Loan Program, which saw two native CDFIs, floor bands, and Mazda Squad double in one year the number of home loans that the USDA provided to two Indian reservations during the previous decade. So that is some astounding work. And the run of the show today is gonna to be, first we're gonna hear from Undersecretary Torres Small, and then we'll shift to the South Dakota native home ownership experts followed by comments by the US representative, Sharice Davids. Um, and then after that, we'll go into a Q and A with the uh, U.S. Representative Davids and Undersecretary Torres Small to take questions from the attendees about the project and how the legislation introduced in Congress seeks to turn the project into a permanent program with adequate funding to help meet the country or Indian country's mortgage lending capital needs. So I'm honored to introduce uh, Sochil Torres Small, Undersecretary of Rural Development and I wouldn't be doing her justice if I didn't read her bio, which is very outstanding. Um, so before coming to the US Rural Development, Sochil was a United States representative for the fifth largest district in the country. In the midst of COVID crisis, Sochil kept the rural hospital from closing its doors, improved constituent access to healthcare over the phone and helped secure tens of millions of dollars for broadband in New Mexico through the USDA Reconnect program. Prior to the coronavirus, Sochil raised the alarm of broadband disparities serving on Majority Whip James Claiborne's Rural Broadband Task Force as an original co-sponsor of the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act. As a member of the House Ag Committee, Sochil helped champion the needs of dairy farmers sponsored legislation and to help local producers and rural communities invest in infrastructure to navigate the markets. Sochil forged additional bipartisan solutions to the House Armed Services Committee and the chairwoman of the Oversight Management Accountability Subcommittee for the House of Homeland Security. Sochil was the first woman and first person of color to represent New Mexico's second congressional district. So with that being said, the, the company that we have today and the leadership that we have from not only the um, House of Representatives, the USDA, but the South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition, we're very proud of all the work that they've done and very honored to have Sochil um, interact with us today as we talk about this program that's been um, very successful in South Dakota. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Sochil, and um, welcome you. Thank you so much. It's always a joy to get to see you and, and to get to be with Native CDFI. Uh, this is one of the first uh, groups that I got to engage with when I first started uh, as Undersecretary for Rural Development. And now, nine months in, I, I have a much better sense of our relationship and our partnership and, and where we can go. So it's just lovely to see folks on the screen, both uh, in Rural Development's team and in the broader Rural Development team uh, and, and faces that I've seen I've seen your work on the ground now, and it has a whole new meaning. And so I'm just deeply grateful to get to be a part of, of this team. Um, I recently got to spend a little more time, a little bit of time back home in New Mexico for 4th of July. I was there for three days, and I was out hiking more times than there were days that I was there, uh, just because I missed home so much. Um, but as I was out there with my husband, I was thinking about how you can walk a path, and it'll look one way when you walk alone. But when you're with someone else and someone that you care a lot about, uh, it can look a completely different way. And I feel that way about partnership um, with Native CDFIs. Um, we can all walk the path of, uh, of, of getting homes in rural areas and better serving Indian country. 
But what that path looks like uh, is completely different when we walk it together. And the uh, impact on the ground is completely different when we when we walk it together, uh, the, the, the changes that, that can be made. And so I'm just so deeply grateful for your partnership and, and for what we can do together in Indian country. And really, frankly, with Native CDFIs as the lead, uh, which is which is what I think the South Dakota pilot really shows. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, that chance to get to walk the path with you. And I'm very excited to talk about this pilot. I will tell you, I have um, had the chance uh, in front of uh, the, the Senate Banking Subcommittee on Housing uh, and in other forums to, to brag about the great work that you all are doing with the South Dakota pilot. Um, I get to tell those stories a lot. But this is a rare time where I get to hear more of the stories. And so that's what I've been looking forward to the most in terms of this dialogue is, you know, you, you talk about the seven, the, the um, 17 or 15 loans that have been made so far. Um, but I want to hear about the challenges that you overcame to get to those loans. Um, I want to hear about the way you prepared those families for what repayment looks like and, and how that conversation is, is helping advance their future and also um, it builds building a, a case for a future for a lot more people, um, hopefully, as, as the pilot expands. Um, it was the clearest point of bipartisan interest uh, at that Senate um, Banking Subcommittee meeting. And uh, it's, I think, a real opportunity uh, just to show the, the impact of local rural voices uh, and, and how it can make a difference, not just for uh, people's homes in South Dakota, but beyond. So uh, really excited to, to get to hear that and help amplify that, um, those stories in the future. Um, it's a great example of where we have a challenge, which is our 502, which is a great pot of funds um, and, a, and a great loan product, um, isn't always, one, the most flexible, and two, it's a really hard uh, there's a real education gap. It's a hard program to, to uh, get people ready for. And depending on where you are, what it takes to get people ready to buy at home uh, looks different. And so it's the perfect example of where being able to have that relationship with people uh, on the ground already, um, knowing the cultural competencies that are necessary for that, and having that long-term investment in what your home looks like is so crucial. And, and that's where we're really excited to see how this partnership can flourish. Um, we're also really excited to have your feedback when it comes to flexibility. Uh, the, you have seen and encountered the barriers firsthand when it comes to our 502 program. And so in addition to having to jump over those hurdles uh, in the process midstream, we also want your advice on how to remove some of those burdens, those hurdles and burdens in the future. Uh, so that might look like regulatory changes that we can embark on now together. It also might look like further conversations with Congress who's asked us um, for what some of those burdens are um, to be able to identify ways uh, to impact the 502 direct loan pro program into the future. So I, I, I'm, I'm excited for the conversation and specifically for your feedback uh, on those areas. It's easy to say we want to be more flexible, but then the details come and we have to figure out what flexibility actually looks like. What's that specifically that specific line in the reg or in the guidance memo that has to be changed in order to make that work? And that's where communication with stakeholders is the most important because we don't always know what parts of our programs aren't as flexible as they need to be. Uh, with that, I just want to also say how excited I am that I get to have a, a bit of a conversation and get to hear uh, from Congresswoman Davids as well. Um, she is someone I always looked up to when I was uh, a representative um, serving New Mexico's second congressional district and uh, her perspective and strength uh, and frankly, humor is, is so exciting. So uh, really appreciate your chance to, to bring her on, uh, on board and to, to talk about um, her perspective in terms of the legislative process. Process. Um, and also, again, to share those stories so that all of us are on the same page about the impact that this has uh, for those 15 new homeowners and, and hopefully more in the future. Um, so with that, I know we will have a lot of lessons learned and um, a lot of opportunities to collaborate more closely together. 
And in learning these lessons and achieving this kind of success in reaching communities that have so typically been underserved, it aligns perfectly with an overarching goal that rural development has and, and that the Biden-Harris administration has. Uh, because the rural development team uh, literally wakes up every morning thinking about rural America, thinking about Indian country and how we can be better partners, how we can be more effective partners, um, how we can better lift up the left behind of the left behind, people across rural America who have been underserved, not just because they're rural, but because of discrimination and uh, systemic injustice. And so whether that's housing or water or broadband, we're working to make sure that people know they haven't been forgotten. Uh, and it's, it's our solemn goal, and I'm grateful that it's a shared goal that we have with each of you. Nothing moves us towards equity quite like foundational infrastructure in the places that are needed most. And I would venture to say there's no firmer a foundation than a home. Nothing gets us there faster uh, than investing in people on the ground and finding ways to do that more flexibly and more simply. And this is a concept that we have also in 1RD, which is where we've removed unnecessary regulations specifically in order to increase private investment in rural businesses and economic development projects. Uh, so I'm interested to hear as well uh, from some of the crucial stakeholders that we have, uh, if you've had any interactions with 1RD and how we might be able to improve that process as well. Uh, 1RD also aims to improve customer service within uh, the four flagship loan guarantee programs. As you know, that's water and waste, community facilities, uh, business and industry, and then also our Rural Energy for America program. So we have a standard set of requirements, processes, and forms for all of these programs. So if you haven't taken advantage of 1RD yet, I encourage you to. And if you had, even more importantly, I encourage uh, you to provide us feedback on how we can make it even better. And in the last minute, I just want to put in a plug for our Rural Partners Network. It is one of the things that I am most excited about uh, when it comes to rural development, because although it is key areas and investments uh, in some of the most underserved places across our country, it's also about sharpening our federal coordination, uh, providing a front door uh, for people on the ground to better access uh, federal entities, better communicate those challenges, and for us to better respond to them. Uh, so if any of you are engaged in a Rural Partners Network community, I'm eager to hear from you, and I'm eager to hear for how we can uh, improve that federal coordination and be that voice for rural, uh, as rural development is the one agency that has that unique mission. So in short, rural development is excited to be that front door to federal government for rural America. And we know uh, that it can have an impact, not just in terms of those communities that are currently members of the Rural Partners Network, but also in reshaping how we engage with partners across the country. So I'll leave you with this thought. I believe that economic development and the funding of local efforts can be a bridge between our heritage and our future. And the impactful economic development efforts that I've seen uh, since these nine months on the job remind me that we can't walk this path alone that the path looks different when we walk it together. We see new things, we approach things differently, and I am get to learn from you to, do, to walk further together and so much. Thank you, um, Undersecretary, thank you very much. And one thing that we do wanna thank you for is your work in um, getting across the finish line into the administration's budget, the 20 point Eight million set aside out of the 1.5 billion for the 502 direct loan program. And yesterday, the House approved a 12 million dollar set aside um, for relending. So we thank you for your hard work in getting that across the finish line. Um, and what we want to move to the next portion of this and really find out from those that are on the ground in South Dakota doing some of the great work up there. And we're going to start with some uh, questions for them. And we're going to start with Stephanie, um, um, provost with Mazasqua on the Pine Ridge Re Indian Reservation. Um, and Stephanie, this question's for you. Working with the USDA must have required a certain degree of collaboration, coordination, which we all know requires a certain degree of trust and relationship. Can you tell us about what that experience looked like 
including some of the challenges and wins that you had? Um, yes, so we actually, um, the Mazaska staff actually established a very good working relationship with the people from RD that was assigned to help us. We discussed, we communicate at every, every situation and we found solutions to it. You know, we, um, we followed a lot of the USDA guidelines, but um, our biggest challenge was, was the land part of it, of course. Um, which Mazaska has a great working relationship with the tribal land office and BIA. So I did a lot of the ground running front on that part. So I think that's the benefit of being the CDFI doing this part of the loan is that, you know, we get that relationships locally and we can go and do it on behalf of the client whenever they're lost on where to go and what to do. Thank you. And then we'll shift over to Tani brunch with Lakota funds. Um, why is the 502 program so important for Indian country? Is it truly the only option available for native borrowers? So you have two questions there, Tony. You're on mute there, sorry. So I, I get to be the first one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> You're on mute, I hate that. At any rate, I was saying thank you, first of all, for the opportunity um, to join this conversation. Um, it, it, it is definitely a partnership, and we are walking together to, to figure this out, honestly, but we are making great progress, it feels like, um, since we launched this um, pilot. So is it the only loan product? No, it's not the only loan product, um, but if if we could have all of the loan products be as good as the 502, honestly, what this has worked out to be, and I know it's currently being lifted up as a model for even the proposed changes, um, improvements to the Native American direct loan product offered to our Native American veterans. It is getting, you know what I mean? It's being lifted up that way. And so the truth is, um, obviously, we have uh, Mazaska, for example, that has been around for what, Steph, like almost 30 years already um, as a native CDFI um, doing mortgage lending, approving loans for not only construction home improvement, but the longer term 30 year mortgages, they, you know, with the five in one, um, the um, balloon in some of the riskiest counties in the nation, honestly, and they're doing it with great success, very little delinquency. But the truth is what holds them back is the lack of loan capital available to relend. You always have a pipeline as a native CDFI in, in our types of communities on Pine Ridge and Rosebud, Cheyenne River, um, where you have a whole pipeline of borrowers. Um, they're, they're on our doorstep. We're trying to serve them because no one else is, honestly. We, we're also in a credit desert. <laughs> where there is no other access to um, any types of loans, but especially not the mortgage loans, largely because of the trust land status. So would we, um, is this the only loan product? No, we've had to be creative, but this loan product is allowing us to serve more of that pipeline, right? Um, the, the fact that 502 um, is for the, the low income, um, populations that we serve, the fact that the 502 allows that subsidy to be able to reduce the interest rate um, to 1% for some of those lower income borrowers. Um, obviously, that's a big help. Um, obviously, you know, anytime you're dealing with a limited repayment capacity um, that, that our lower income borrowers are, it's always good to reduce the interest rate. So it's been a, a good model. Um, it's also, we appreciate the fact that, you know, during COVID um, where some families experienced that loss of income um, due to all of that, um, the, the role development was great to work with and allowing there to be some, um, some exceptions and some leeway on when payment was expected, et cetera. Um, it's just, it's been good all the way around. So it's good for the borrower, obviously. Our Native families are able to achieve home ownership. It's good for the Native CDFIs because we don't have the access to um, capital 
loan capital to relend. And obviously it's good for USDA because a lot of times what we found at least in South Dakota is that our rural development offices are busting ass. I mean, they are doing a great job of trying to do that outreach, but the truth is because we're so remote, it's really, really hard sometimes for our borrowers to get to that rural development office wherever it's located. And so why not use the pipeline and the access and the relationships that our native CDFIs have? It's, it's obviously good for USDA too. So we're, we're helping deploy that loan capital. Thank you, Tony. And then we're gonna put uh, Lakota up next here. Lakota, I've got a question for you. Um, as a host of the CDFI for this pilot project, what were some of the challenges your organization faced? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being on and thank you uh, for the inspiring speech to set this conversation up. I think um, I'm going to, I, I will talk about the challenges for sure. And I, I, I know that that's important, but I just want to frame this quickly in a way of talking about just mortgage period, right? So currently what we face in rural underserved areas like ours is that there's this word mortgage out there that has been so regulated by financial institutions and so defined without our voice at the table, that it, it's actually left out 56 million acres of land considered by trust land. So when people sat around the table of their financial institution and designed a tool called the mortgage, they actually left out how to mortgage the 56 million acres in America, right? Which is trust land. That's what we're doing as CDFIs in partnership with USDA and trying to solve that issue. And so fortunately we were able to, you know, have this partnership with USDA and do this loan um, there, there are the challenges, um, but basically that has allowed us to begin to be a role model for other financial institutions on how to mortgage trust land. So in my community on Shrine River, um, of the 11 loans that we put out the door, they're all within the reservation boundaries and they nine of them are on trust land, right? So we have found a way to mortgage trust land. It can happen. It happens in Palm Springs, California daily. And it happened in Pine Ridge and it's happening here. And that's the story we really want to tell. And we appreciate USDA support of, of allowing us to pilot this and have such great success. Some of the challenges are simply just working through a pilot program. You know, Tani mentioned the subsidy interest, which is helpful to the borrower because it, you know, it lowers the rate for them. But some of that is difficult for me as a CDFI and running a business in that I have to find the subsidy gap at the end of the loan term with the borrower. So say it was supposed to be 3%, but they got the subsidy and it went down to 1%. So that accumulates over the life of the loan. And at the end of the loan, when our family wants to be an asset owner and own their asset, they have to find a way to pay off that subsidy. And so to me, that's not really growing assets or wealth generation. It's also just creating another barrier for that. So that would that's something we need to creatively think through. Um, we would really love a match waiver on this. So getting the million dollars from, you know, 800,000 from mm -hmm. USDA was great, but then we had to put up 200,000 of our own capital. And at some point I had to, you know, put up my own capital because there were some construction projects that didn't happen timely enough. So as an older CDFI, it was possible, but if we're trying to grab the whole nation and use this tool throughout the nation, it's not going to be possible for everybody to come up with that match. And there's precedent for match waivers and other federal programs. And lastly, I just think the administration costs, like Stephanie mentioned, she's the boots on the ground going to the realty office. It would really be great if we could model this offer after like our map, the Rural Microenterprise Assistance Program, um, mm -hmm. and offer some administrative dollars annually for how much money we've deployed so that we can continue to pay the Stephanie's and my loan officer April annually to do the work to get these systems that have been rusty and not utilized, right, to keep oiling those wheels and keep them moving so we can get more mortgages to our communities. But Truly, overall, so happy that USD, you know, partnered on this, and it's a great pilot to success. We just need the support, I guess, in sort of fine tuning some of these these challenges. But thank you. Thank you, Lakota. Uh, the next question we're going to shoot over to Joanna. Um, Joanna, to keep the momentum of this bill going, more sponsors are needed. What are some of the key states that can help move this bill forward? Thanks, Pete. I'm um, very excited to be here along with the other members of the, the South Dakota Native Homeownership Coalition. Um, uh, you know, here, here, the short answer is that every single um, representative and senator is important um, as a co-sponsor of this pending legislation. Um, as folks may know, Senator Smith and Senator Rounds introduced um, 
as 2092 in the Senate. And then um, Representative um, Johnson rep, uh, introduced the companion bill in the House. And um, we are trying to, you know, if for those on the line who think this is great policy and wants it to expand into Indian country um, nationwide, and it, for it to be a permanent program of USDA, um, I would contact your representative or senator no matter where you live. Um, and that's easy to do. And um, this is a non-controversial, no, um, you know, non-partisan um, piece of legislation that improves Native economies um, across Indian country, as we've heard from from the CDFIs there. Um, so, and, and um, I believe NCN is gonna be posting some tools on, on, the web, on their website for you to use to reach out to your members. Um, of course, um, and, and the reason why it's every member is important, every senator, every, every representative is that um, there's a process in the Senate called the fast track, where if, you, if something gets put on the unanimous consent calendar, um, something can be put on the unanimous consent calendar if it has a strong support. And we have nine senators uh, who are co-sponsoring this bill. Um, the more senators you have, the more likely it is to be um, to, to, to follow those paths. The other path that's a possibility in both the House and the Senate is for this legislation to be um, put together in with other Indian housing um, bills and kind of a mini um, omnibus bill. Um, so the more support there is um, through co-sponsorships, the more, the more likely it is for that to happen. Um, having said all that, obviously the this the jurisdiction, the committee with jurisdiction over this is the in the Senate. It's the Senate Banking Committee, and the House is the um, the House Financial Services Committee. Um, so, if your member, your senator, or your representative are, are on either of those committees, they're important. Um, it, we are especially looking um, th at the states where there's high native population. So um, if you're from Arizona, um, Senator Sinema is important. If you're from Idaho, Senator Crapo is important in Wyoming and Kansas and Montana. Um, Senator Tester is, is the co-sponsor, but Senator Daines is not. <laughs> um, and looking at the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, Pete, where I know you guys just spent a lot of focus, um, there's 12 members on, this, on that committee. Seven of them are co-sponsors. Um, the, the five who are not, who we would love to be, um, is Senator Cantwell from Washington, Senator Mikowski from Alaska, Senator Hoven from North Dakota, Senator Langford from um, Oklahoma, and Senator Moran from Kansas. So um, those, those are some targets because we know that they have a lot of, um, of um, Native people in their states, um, and they're on committees that we care about. So um, most of the USDA um, programs are under the Ag Committee, but because this, this program is under the banking committees, um, and so that's why this is kind of a, a new territory for, um, for um, not, not so much new, but um, you know, it's not the typical rural um, programs that you're looking at. So hopefully that answers um, kind of the priorities, but as I say, just to underscore, Everyone is important. Every member of Congress, every senator is important um, uh, with this work. And um, we've got some, the South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition. Um, it used to be just folks in South Dakota talking about this, but now we've got a really broad um, coalition of, of folks nationally, um, not only the Native CDFI network, but also um, many national native organizations and rural housing organizations that, and some of them are on the line today. So thank you all um, to, who have been such great partners in getting the word out about the, this, this fantastic policy. Thank you, Joanna. And um, we're, we're on a very uh, tight schedule today, but one thing that we do want to um, point out is that at two o'clock from two to 2.30, we're gonna stay on as long as everyone wants to stay on for questions from our experts from South Dakota. But we're gonna introduce, um, I'm proud to introduce um, Congresswoman Davids um, has just joined us, so uh, welcome. And again, I wouldn't be able to do this uh, you justice if I didn't um, read your bio here. It's it's truly amazing. So um, Representative Davids was re raised by a single mother who served in the, the Army for 20 years. And after graduating from Leavenworth High School, she worked through Johnson County Community College and the University of Missouri at Kansas City and in earning her law degree from Cornell University. As a first generation college student who worked the entire time she was in college, Representative Davids understands the importance of quality public schools and affordable higher education 
it is that foundation that allowed her to go on to, to a successful career focused on economic and community development, which included time as a White House fellow under President Barack Obama. She was sworn into the 116th Congress and was one of first one of of the first two Native American women to serve in Congress. So I welcome you, um, Congresswoman Davids, and very proud to, and honored to have you on our call today. And I know your time is limited as well. So uh, I do want to point out that we we just made our first loan, a Native 360 out of Nebraska in Leavenworth, Kansas. So we're starting to serve the, the state of Kansas, which you represent, so very proud of that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point. Well, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction and um, I'm excited to be here and see some familiar faces. Um, I, I certainly, but, well, you, you did my bio. Um, so thank you for saving me a couple minutes so that we can get to the questions earlier. Uh, Cause I think that's usually the more, more fun parts of these, but um, yeah, I, I absolutely am uh, so honored to have been uh, elected in 2018 alongside my dear friend, uh, Deb Holland is the first two native women uh, ever elected. And, you know, I mean, and she left me, it's fine. Um, just kidding. We're all very proud. We're all very proud of her. And I think she's doing an amazing job, but, um, yeah, so I'm Ho-Chunk, uh, from Wisconsin, but my, my mom was in the army, which is how a Ho-Chunk ends up in Kansas. Um, and you know, I've, I've been in Congress for a, a few years now and just want to give a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, uh, context and update about the work that I've been able to do. Uh, so I serve on the small business committee. And in, it's, I love it, um, but, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time there trying to work to amplify the voices of folks in Indian country and uh, work to ensure that our entrepreneurs have the resources that they need uh, to start uh, to start and grow a successful business. And uh, of course, that absolutely includes entrepreneurs um, on and off reservation. Uh, we know that Native communities uh, face some unique barriers to economic growth, including greater difficulty accessing financial services. Um, and that includes uh, accessing financial services needed to find housing. And nationally, and I hopefully, I know y'all started a little while ago, so hopefully I won't be repeating too much here, but um, you know, nationally the home ownership rate for uh, native households is about 54%, uh, whereas the rate for white households is 72.1%. Uh, and you know, I think that's why the Department of Ag, uh, the Department of Agriculture's uh, Section 502 direct loan program uh, is such an important source of mortgage financing, uh, particularly for uh, uh, families that might be struggling a bit or living in uh, rural communities. And um, I know th through the South Dakota pilot program, uh, the two native CDFIs uh, there have provided double the number of loans um, on, on their reservations than the USDA did uh, on the same two reservations in the previous decade. And I think what that demonstrates is that native CDFIs have that local knowledge and expertise on the ground to help uh, reach native home buyers more effectively. And especially when we're talking about home buyers who are uh, living on tribal lands. And it's um, that's actually a, a big part of why I uh, was uh, excited to co-sponsor uh, Rep. D Dusty Johnson's bill, uh, H.R. 6331, the Native American Rural Home Ownership Improvement Act, uh, because, you know, this bill expands on the success of that pilot program and creates a, a national relending program within Section 502 to help deploy these mortgage loans in Native communities. And uh, I know uh, my, my friend, uh, Under Secretary Torres Small can speak to the 502 loan program uh, probably much more eloquently than I can, um, but I, I do want to share, uh, you know, so, some of the other stuff that I'm uh, working on in Congress to support access to financial services for tribal communities and on uh, on tribal lands. So last year, I uh, worked with. Uh, our Congressional Native American Caucus co-chair Tom Cole um, to, to 
work out um, uh, uh, some communication. You know, we sent a letter over to the CDFI director um, to, to Director Harris. And really, we wanted to make sure that we were clear in asking that the CDFI fund afford uh, full and fair consideration of new market tax credit allocations for community development entities with uh, uh, community development entities that have a primary mission of serving Indian country. And we know that our, our American Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian communities uh, absolutely face some unique barriers when we're when we're talking about uh, accessing capital. And uh, we also know that in uh, several past rounds, the CDFI fund has done uh, exactly what we asked, allocating new market tax credits to uh, to CDEs whose primary mission are to serve uh, Indian country. And from those allocations, we've seen the construction of things like new healthcare facilities, uh, the development of small small businesses and uh, installation of new infrastructure, uh, huge infrastructure over here, um, and so it it's I mean it's very clear that when capital is deployed to uh, to CDEs that focus on Indian country that uh, the the potential for those positive community impacts is so much greater, and so you know I know I've been doing this since I got here, but. Um, there are a number of us that are working together to increase funding for native uh, CDFI, uh, for the native CDFI assistance program or uh, NACA. And, um, you know, I think for this fiscal year, we're uh, in the house, we're looking at a $21.5 million um, funding level. Uh, it's like 27.5 uh, in the Senate. So like clearly we've got some, some work to do there when we're talking about the appropriations process uh, so that we can get more support into, um, uh, so we can get more support into this program. And you know that's something that I'm gonna continue to, to advocate for or push for. Um, and then another, another thing that we're doing is uh, another way that we're, we're working to ensure that uh, tribal business communities can grow uh, and succeed is by making sure that we're including Native voices at the table when we're talking about um, and discussing and working through uh, federal policy that's absolutely going to uh, directly impact uh, uh, tribal business communities. And, um, you know, this, this, that concept is, uh, is why I introduced the Native American Entrepreneurial Opportunity Act. I'm kind of surprised I didn't get tongue twisted on that. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, for, for folks who, who don't know about that piece of legislation, it's a bill that would uh, essentially double the funding for uh, SBA's, uh, the Small Business Administration's Office of Native American Affairs, and would also create an associate administrator position to uh, really set the direction of that office. And, you know, right now, Surprise, surprise, um, the office is underfunded, uh, a bit understaffed, and, um, and you know, doesn't have a, a, a clear mission and way to achieve that mission. So it's just, it's not really working. And this bill would uh, update the office's mission. It would um, mandate that the office establish a government-to-government -government working relationship with tribes uh, and Native Hawaiian organizations. And um, it really targets uh, and con uh, connects SBA programs uh, with Native entrepreneurs and, and small business owners. And you know, the, the bill also um, would, I feel like I'm talking for a long time. Am I not going over time? Am I? I'm just like, and this thing and this thing, um, just wave at me if, uh, if, if I'm going over time here, because I feel like I'm, I just have a lot. I get excited about this stuff, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so the, the bill also would make sure that, um, uh, that the, uh, that, that there's a, a, a grant making ability and establish this field offices within uh, the existing SBA regional offices. 
Um, and you know, that's so that the offices can provide training, counseling, access to entrepreneurial and contracting programs. And, um, and then also to, to perform the very important function of conducting uh, tribal consultation. And so anyway, I'm, I'm just, I'm really glad I'm, I'm getting a chance to, uh, to visit with all of you today because uh, certainly native, native CDFIs, native homeowners, um, you know, like just y'all are the folks who are in uh, in the driver's seat and and should be in the driver's seat. So um, I guess I'll I would just say like you know make sure reaching out to your members of Congress and and uh, asking them to educate themselves about these issues and uh, to support bills like HR sixty three thirty one. Um, that's really that's a really important part of us uh, getting the support together so we can get it across the finish line. And um, certainly, I want to be uh, as as strong a partner as I can be in all of this. Um, Rainy Williams, who's in my office, uh, who would normally she's she works on our team. She does tribal policy. Would normally be here today, but she is uh, studying for the bar exam. Um, so everybody, like, cross your fingers. Send her. Uh, 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 send her good, uh, good energy and, um, and vibes. And, um, and then I guess I'll last thing promise. Um, I just, I, I do want to just kind of, uh, note or, or highlight that, um, you know, I, I appreciate, uh, Congressman, uh, Dusty Johnson's support of, uh, housing affordability efforts, um, in Indian country. And then also, um, the leadership of uh, of our undersecretary, uh, Tara Small, for uh, continue con your leadership and also continued support for Native communities. You were um, uh, doing that uh, prior to this role, and I'm I'm really appreciative that you continue to do to do that. So I'll stop so we can right. get to questions and stuff. Well, I thank you for your comments and uh, very again very honored to have you on board today. So we're going to start the Q&A session with um, our two featured guests. And um, Kristen, I'm going to have you lead the way with the first question. There. All right. Great to see everyone. I'm Kristen Wagner. I'm NCN's program director. Thank you so much for being here today. I love seeing all the faces and our special guests. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us today and, and our members and hearing all these amazing success stories and what you're all doing as well. So we do have one question to kick it off and this is for Congresswoman Davids. Um, and then we'll take a few more from the audience, but um, here's your first question. So federal, state and tribal policymakers really seem to be turning increasingly to native CDFIs to assist with jumpstarting the flow of capital to native communities. And this is such good news and a really welcome trend. What is it about native CDFIs and say CDFIs in general that appeals to policymakers about serving as conduits for economic development? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I think that uh, a I have a couple of I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I know for I mean, for me personally, I can say that, um, you know, I think my general approach is to uh, try to figure out who are the people doing the boots on the ground work, um, who are the ones who are going to understand the day to day um, challenges and successes and um, and seek those folks out and ask them lots of questions. Uh, the when it comes to CDFIs, um, I just, you know, I mean, Lakota Funds is on here today. I've had the chance to um, work directly uh, with them on, on a couple of different occasions. So uh, I personally have had the chance to see the ways that um, native CDFIs are, are the experts and should be in the room and part of the conversation. Um, uh, but there's also just kind of uh, objectively, even if, you know, I think my approach is one that I hope more members of Congress will take, but I also think that um, that even if objectively, if you didn't come into into it with a, a understanding ahead of time, like all you have to do is look at the track record. I mean, there's a track record of success there, and I think the uh, I think you know we're seeing a combination of federal and state government 
it's recognizing that track record of success. Um, and, and then I think, you know, the, the, the efforts that, um, that like, like we've got multiple pages of, uh, of folks who are working on these issues, um, who have, who are, uh, you know, waving, waving your arms and saying, uh, you know, here's, here's the stuff that we need. And, um, I'm, I'm really glad to see how many, uh, electeds, particularly at the federal level are really starting to recognize that. Great. Thank you so much. I am going to ask one of our audience members to come off mute. Dave Castillo, I believe you have a question for Undersecretary Torres. Yeah, thank you. Um, Undersecretary Torres Small and um, Representative Davids, thank you so much for everything you do. Um, I do have a question in the chat, but I think I've, I've got a better one based on the first question that was asked. Um, we're uh, a native CFI, we're uh, headquartered in Laguna Pueblo. So, uh, under Secretary Small, Small, next time you're out there, please stop by. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, so, really, this question has to do with this this question of I think reward and resolve, right? Um, you know, the question that was asked is why are native CFIs looked at by policymakers, and how does what they do is so important? Um, unfortunately, I don't know that we've got the private sector on the same page um, in discussions uh, relative to CRA and duty to serve. Um, you know, when we speak with lenders, uh, financial institutions and GSEs, um, the, the thought seems to be, if you're not ready, we're not gonna go with you, right? Because the reward's too small. You're too small a population, you're spread across too broad a geography, there's not enough money to be made, and there's too much brain damage on our part to be able to, con to uh, develop products and uh, financial products and services to serve Indian country, which I'm fond of saying, you know, we put a man on the moon, uh, we, we landed a rover on Mars and we looked into the deepest spaces, you know, parts of the cosmos, but we can't look in our backyards and put a bank on a reservation that'll make mortgage loans, right? So I think in that sense, there's too little reward for them. And so it really falls to policymakers, regulators, and others to have the resolve to say, no, private sector, uh, you must do this, whether it's under duty to serve, whether it's, um, you know, through some other uh, regulation. And I just wonder... You know, what I've been told is it's all about partnerships, develop those partnerships, show them that you are capable of delivering, uh, you know, the, the pipeline and the production that they need to see to be able to make investments. And we'll get there, but we need federal program dollars and help to build our capacity, build our balance sheets and be able to play on a level to playing field, which is why I think the work that you all are doing is so important and what we're doing is so important. Uh, but what else could we do? Um, what else could you do uh, to get the private sector uh, to play ball? Thanks. I'll, I'll start and then happily turn it over to Congresswoman David. But uh, this is a, a huge question and it's come into even greater focus uh, with the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed. And the real challenge, the idea that there's a lot of uh, money out there, we want to make sure it gets to uh, the places that need it most. And whether it's a grant or especially if it's a loan, to have that capacity on that grant on the ground to be able to not just make the application, but uh, survive the feasibility study, uh, to survive the the technical uh, requirements, and then to be able to process that award on the back end, which takes a lot of work. And, and I'll be honest with you, we've had conversations within rural development, um, both with the 502 package, I think it's related to the question you put in the chat, right? Uh, both in terms of 502 pilot, but also the 502 packaging, there was a lot of resistance within rural development that, you know, if we, if we were to do this, does this take away the role of rural development employees and our role in providing that technical assistance and, and our value, frankly, in being in 450 offices across the country and having people live in the places where they serve. And the answer is no, um, because there's so much technical assistance that needs to happen. There's plenty of space for all of us. And if we don't have uh, folks who are stuck processing uh, all of the loans, but instead processing a packaging application or processing um, an application from a native CDFI, uh, we can then identify more regulatory barriers to fix nationally. We can then do more outreach and convening with philanthropic partners, which I think is a key part. We can present a more cohesive strategy of a place 
that is sometimes what the philanthropic partners are most looking for in terms of that, how do we um, create that partnership? I think often what uh, philanthropic partners lack is the vision of the place and the commitment of the folks on the ground. And so to be able to be a convening partner within rural development, I think we see a real value in being able to do that and, and better leverage that. And then also presenting um, a case for what private money can leverage on the federal end. We're making sure that those regulations can leverage that capital stack in different ways. Uh, it becomes a, a, a better conversation and ultimately a better partnership. So I, I think that um, honestly, our future for rural development staff on the ground really depends on being able to do more things like this, this 502 pilot. Congresswoman Davids, did you want to add to that? Oh, I think that was like a really good answer, actually. I mean, I could do a politician thing and come up with some extra fluff to add so that I talk longer, but no, I think, I mean, that was a great answer. All right, well, thank you so much. We do have another question for, oh, go ahead, Pete. Were you gonna ask Linda? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Yeah, we do have another question. Um, okay, so for some native CDFIs, there may be capacity implications with some of these new opportunities. I think um, Lakota Vogel spoke a little bit about that when she shared her story. Um, what can we do to help policymakers understand how important it is to pair operating funds um, with the authority to deploy this public capital? And that can go to both of you. Either one of you would like to answer. I'm already unmuted, so maybe I'll go first this time and then. Um, so I think, well, there's a couple of things that, um, and actually I think, uh, uh, our, our undersecretary, it's so hard, I kinda wanna call you by your first name, but I gotta be, I'm trying to be formal here. Um, so I think there's a couple of things about capacity that I think are really, really important um, for all of us to keep in mind. Um, one is that uh, these conversations actually that I know that um, native CDFIs have been having with policymakers, with the folks who are, um, <clears throat> career folks in these different programs and stuff is um, highlighting, just like highlighting where those needs are. Because I think one of the biggest barriers that I see uh, when it comes to the federal government's approach to um, things like technical assistance, which, which I think should be more, and I don't know if this is like a shift um, that, uh, like how far into the shift we're, we're seeing this happen so far. Um, but I would love folks to, to reach out and let us know is that, um, when large amounts of money are being deployed, there will often be something that says like, yeah, and we're going to offer technical assistance. And then folks see that and they're like, oh, this is great. They pick up the phone, they call their regional office or whoever they've been working with, if they've already been working with somebody and they say, hey, I noticed there's some technical assistance. And they're like, yeah, you got to fill out form 6428B uh, and don't forget to uh, hit on sub point I or something. And it's like, okay, that's not actually technical assistance. Um, like I could look it up and see uh, we already know how to do the bureaucratic paperwork. Um, what is it you mean when you say we need two years of this and it's like the language doesn't match up with the actual programs that we're doing or like the outcomes you're asking for are, are, uh, are not outcomes, but the like reporting standards that, you, that you're asking for are like, it kind of doesn't make sense because you're talking about something that's not applicable in a rural community or is, I mean, that's less likely to happen with like, you know, the, the 502 program. But I think like uh, this happens broadly across a bunch of different programs. And I think that um, one, it's really helpful for uh, especially policymakers, although I think um, it's probably more true for the, for the folks who are working in, um, in, on the executive side in the implementation of these things. But it is helpful for policymakers, I think, to understand that 
what capacity means is not just like how many full-time employees do you have? It also is how many people in the region really understand uh, what, what the goal of the programs are or, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and to me, that's one of the biggest, uh, uh, one of the, one of the biggest, um, reasons that it's so important when we talk about like pairing, uh, uh, operating funds, um, and, and, you know, deploying the public capital is, um, it's just like, we have to understand that the, the policymakers have to understand like where those hiccups are and, uh, you know, having a, I've, again, I'm lucky I've had the chance to work with, uh, native CDFIs, but like in Congress, I always say, assume we know nothing. And I think that's probably the best assumption you can make about anybody in Congress so that, you know, um, uh, to start from like ground zero, assume we know nothing and, and be very detailed in explaining like where, where, where's the hiccups on, uh, on deploying this stuff. That felt very long. I'm sorry. Well, thank you. It was so long. I think our undersecretary dropped off. I don't know where she went. Yeah, she had a hard stop at 1.55 today. Oh, okay. <laughs> and your time's running out. I think we have about three more minutes for you, but I, I want to shift back to our group from South Dakota. And um, this would be your time to ask um, Congresswoman that what, or let, let her know what improvements to the policy would you suggest? So that we're hearing it from the ground floor. Yeah. Maybe Tani or Stephanie, Lakota. What what uh, what improvements could we have for the the policy moving forward? I'm just going to do a general one and thank you, Representative David. Yeah. So I'm trying to be all formal as well, but no, thank no, you. No, it's like for... you. Please call. <laughs> My preference would be that you call me Sharice. Right. So I'm going to take the, the, the general one, honestly, um, as far as improvements to the 502. And it's just it's just me always asking for more than what seems like, you know, should be possible is the fact that how nice would it be um, for the native CDFIs to be able to use that 502 money? Yes, at 1%, but to um, to deploy with their own loan products. You know what I mean? Mm. The beauty of CDFIs, honestly, is that we know what's best for our community. We've created the products that we can prove are effective. It's really mm -hmm. just the only thing that slows us down is the lack of, of capital to relend. How nice would it be if we could use that 502 money to fit our own, the construction loan and meet our requirements? Yes, you know, it's still going to be have to be a 502 eligible borrower or whatever, but the construction loan, you know, the, the term of the loan, whatever it is, um, and that we they, it, we could use it just to, to, to provide the capital for our own mortgage loan products. Hmm. That would really, be one thing. No, huh? I, that what would be would one be thing, one and honestly, oh, I think yeah. it's important to yeah, no, I think, on the ground. Yeah, and actually, I think that, um, like that sounds really intriguing. And I feel like it's something that when, when Rainy gets back from taking her bar exam, um, mm -hmm. we should we should get a call set up because I uh, I feel like this is maybe the um, that can be like the uh, the seed for a, like a larger conversation about the ways that we can I mean, maybe it's a pilot. I mean, maybe this is like a, a new pilot program or something, mm -hmm. and we can start that conversation about um, what that might look like. Uh, you know, I, I, I like I like the idea of the flex. I like the idea of the flexibility for you know. There's the because the for the thing is like with CDFIs the um I well, like I'm literally thinking about this in real time so um the 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 requirements and the like standards and all that stuff mm -hmm. like so many things are already there that you're it's not it's not like uh you know the federal government likes to be like oh no it's too risky 
but it's like, well, this is an institution that's already meeting a whole bunch of standards that um, that have been in place and uh, to continue to be a CDFI, to continue to make act, uh, to access the different programs like the 502. I think um, lend, to, lend to me, that's the kind of stuff that lends itself to um, to uh, persuading uh, per se, persuading policymakers to be open-minded about, um, you know, uh, maybe again, like this sounds like maybe an idea for a pilot program that could eventually turn into, uh, the introduction of a more permanent program or, or something. That's cool. I think that sounds like a cool idea for us to talk about more. Thank you. And Joanna and Stephanie, um, like to hear from both of you, if you would, uh, have any recommendations for the program? Well, I, I mean, Pete, thanks thanks for the opportunity to add to that. Um, I guess I would say, Rep. David's, um, a, a lot of the stuff that's in the bill that you're co-sponsoring, 6331, would be great improvements to the pilot. Um, there's a line item for operating funds, as we talked about earlier. Um, there's also a match waiver, um, as you know. So those, like, continuing to bring that over the finish line, I think would be great because not only does it expand to all of India, the program to all of Indian country, but it, it has some, some pretty cool fixes in the, the stuff that you guys introduced. So thanks for that. And we hope you'll continue to, to, to uh, support that, that bill and others like it. Like there's, a, uh, I think Tani mentioned at the beginning of this call, the, 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 um, the VA um, Native American direct loan program is also um, Representative or Senator Rounds introduced legislation that would um, do relending for VA as well. So it's kind of a model now that's getting a lot of traction. And Stephanie, do you have any um, follow up? Yeah, so I just kind of agree with Tommy because, like, with the CDFIs, like, we, well, what we do is like we have more flexibility with our construction program, you know, because you never know what's going to happen in construction if they need to add stuff. You know, it's we have more flexibility with it as far as like our D, it's a little bit more stricter. So a lot of ours, like we had to do construction and then roll it over to the mortgage before the family got to move in. So, and then to like Lakota mentioned earlier about the subsidy. Um, we, we chose, we had a good discussion with RD on the subsidy recapture, getting the person down to the 1%, but at the end of the loan, the subsidy recapture, they have to pay that back. They don't have the home outright after 30 years of paying for it. So we actually opted not to do that with our clients because it didn't benefit them in the long run, because we had families with five or more children in the homes, you know? Yeah. So that's something that to look at too. Okay. I Representative Davis, I think you have your time's up, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to I was going to actually I was going to say I'm support I'm surprised uh and maybe you're getting it on the back end. Uh uh she's got to go or something cuz I'm getting messages on okay. my little deal here. Um thank you guys so much for um for the work you're doing. Uh, I'm glad I got a chance to, um, to, to join today, uh, for a few minutes and I'll look forward to hopefully, uh, hopefully seeing you all in real life sometime soon. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time and your staff was very generous. So you have a great staff to work with. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll see you all later. Thank you. Thank and we want to keep everybody on board here. We're going to. If anyone has any questions for our um, South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition, um, let's stay on the line and be able to answer those questions because we get them from time to time and now we have the experts on here. So um, does anybody have, would like to come off mute and maybe ask a Joanna or Stephanie or Lakota or not Lakota, but Tani. Um, Lakota had to step off, um, so she will not be with us, but um, please come off mute and let's have a conversation here. I thought our last segment was really good there because um, it, it's just a round table discussion and that's really what we need more, more of, so. Pete, I'd like to ask a question. Yes. Uh, 
I'm up here in North Dakota with uh, rural development, and I've, I've been uh, I've attended uh, meetings of the South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition uh, over the years, and um, really enjoyed watching what they're doing. And I just uh, I'm so amazed by Seven Sisters, Joanna, and uh, so amazed by Tawny and, and the others that have been um, very much involved in all of this. I, um, I'm the Native American Outreach Coordinator up here in rural development uh, with all the tribes uh, here. And um, over the years, and I've been here almost eight years now, um, we've taken uh, literally hundreds of applications for 502 loans and never approved even one in Indian country, which has been just so distressing to me. And the problem boils down to a few things, but the major barrier is um, tribal code language, lack of lender security. Uh, the financial institutions uh, look at the judicial systems here and the code language, um, and they feel like they're just simply not enough protection in the event of borrower default. So I would like to know how Mazaska and how uh, Four Bands have solved that problem. And believe me, I, I'm just so frustrated with it. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Lakota or, or not Lakota Tani or uh, Stephanie or Joanna? Well, I've been with Mazaska for almost six years now. We haven't had to proceed to um, we haven't had to foreclose on anybody yet. Um, our code, the foreclosure is very small too. Um, it does need some work as well. So I don't have enough experience to speak on that part, to be honest. Thank you, Stephanie. And I've actually worked at the courthouse before too, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Good to see you, Holiday. Um, I'm just I'm I'm gonna just jump in here and talk a little bit about the work that the coalition is doing more recently. Um, in in um, we're creating currently a matrix of the the mortgage lending codes and foreclosure codes, the courts and everything else. All the little pieces needed um, from every one of our nine tribes in South Dakota here, and. Um, Although I expect it to be a useful tool for those of us on the ground, right, the practitioners, it's mostly for the rest of it, <laughs> for the country, for the GSEs, for the Freddie Macs, for the Fannie Mae's, um, Federal Home Loan Bank, you know, everybody we're in conversation with to help us figure out the secondary market, which um, we desperately need to figure out in order to be able to continue this mortgage lending. But the truth is that's, that's there to make them feel better, to give them that level of comfort um, with our lending. Because the truth is you can look at Four Bands portfolio, you can look at Mazaska's portfolio. And just like Steph said, it is um, it looks like very risky lending, right? You're not only serving some of the poorest counties in the nation, but you're also doing it basically unsecured because everyone's so uncomfortable with the the trust land and the value, you know, tied to it or lack of value tied to it, but it's a perceived risk because you can see the delinquency rates are under 1%. You know what the key is, is this relationship, is the boots on the ground, the Stephanie's that know how to, and Lakota who know how to have the relationships um, to make sure that that loan doesn't go bad in the first place, right? And so I know it takes some convincing most um, tribal communities, you know, I'm not gonna say most have codes even, but it's something that's pretty easily adopted if they don't, um, then it's just convincing, you know, uh, the in the approval process, really, there has to be a comfort level in the, the TA provided, the assistance in um, not only in underwriting that you know that community, you know that borrower, but that you also know, you know, how to collect or whatever and how not to let it escalate 
into um, a collection in the first place. It's about relationship. Yeah, and if, um, Tony, if I could just build on that, if that's okay, Pete, um, sure. just really quickly. Um, a lot of what, um, you know, why it works so well in South Dakota, it was originally envisioned by um, the, the Rural Development State Director in South Dakota, Elsie um, Meeks, and um, who was the first um, Native American um, state, Rural Development state, state Director. And so that leadership and commitment to making it work and do that relationship building with the boots on the ground that Tani was referring to, I think really came from Elsie. And I also, um, we didn't get a chance to recognize before she got off, Nikki Cronley was is the new state director in South Dakota and has been really personally committed to this and has been a, um, a great advocate um, for the existing pilot and kind of working on improving it and all the state um, staff in South Dakota. But we also have two other, at least two other state directors on the line now. And I think he's the second native state director ever in the history, um, Rudy Soto from Idaho. Um, and then also the state director from, from Montana is on the line today too, Kathleen Williams. So um, I don't, if Rudy's on the line still, if he wants to just to say hello, um, because his leadership, I think that's gonna bring this kind of nationwide um, along with the other, his other colleagues. Thank you so much, um, Joanna. I really appreciate it. Great to see you um, and looking forward to seeing you next week. I appreciate the opportunity just to say a couple words. Um, it's, it's so, it was so great to have our undersecretary from USDA Rural Development on here. It's great to see you, Tani. Uh, it, it was great to join up with some of you from the South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition in Texas uh, to mm -hmm. see some of those potential uh, affordable, scalable solutions to the housing crisis. Um, I'm, I'm also a Shoshone Bannock tribal member. And so I've been really, really um, intensely uh, dedicated to just leaning in and, and finding out ways to uh, be a resource um, as the, you know, the state director in the country that is tribal um, uh, luckily, we do have uh, really, really strong advocates for, for tribal communities, in, uh, especially in our Western states. Uh, Kathleen Williams, my, my counterpart and colleague who might be, might be on as well. Nikki Gronley, um, Julia, um, I don't, I don't want to mispronounce her last name, but she's from Alaska. She's really great. We have a lot of really great state directors and I communicate with all of them um, quite regularly. We have a lot of meetings uh, weekly, bi-weekly with one another. I'm supposed to be on a different one now, but you know, like I said, this is really important to me uh, personally. And uh, I, it, this is so important to us that uh, we, us uh, Western state directors have um, made a plan to come together next week during the Western Governors Association mm -hmm. meeting that's happening in Idaho, in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, they're going to have a you know, bipartisan number of senators in attendance, uh, four cabinet secretaries, uh, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack, Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra, um, Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, and then Department of Veterans Affairs Secretary Dennis McDonough are going to be in attendance. And so uh, we're converging on, on that conference to have our own breakouts and half if not a majority of our time as state directors is going to be focused on uh, how do we do better to um, support economic development in uh, tribal communities. Uh, so we're working with jo Joanna um, and uh, South Do Dakota Homeownership, other uh, points of contact through Nikki Gronley and uh, Michelle Weaver, the Utah State Director on a, on a housing uh, roundtable discussion and then uh, we've invited uh, Secretary, uh, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, Brian Newland, who plans to uh, participate in a, a meeting with us to figure out how we can uh, collaborate better across agencies. And we know there, uh, you all would know well that there are other agencies that are much better at reducing red tape um, and you know, working with tribes. Uh, and then there's also, uh, I think Ted Buell, my colleague who's on here, you know, we're working with a, a group of folks, uh, state directors and uh, staff on a, a, a tribal training for um, our staff. 
And so it was really great to hear the colleague who talked about you know, his disappointment and the amount of lending activity that we have in the single family direct housing in many states outside of the Dakotas, but we're really eager to change that. So uh, we're working on it and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the power of the um, South Dakota Native Home Ownership Coalition, I believe, I recently attended one of their um, tours. And the thing that I was the most impressed with was the number of different organizations, agencies, governmental, tribal, state, legislative. It was really developing a, an ecosystem there to create housing. And you're taking your work now, you know, nationwide to Idaho. And um, I know Stephanie is going to go with Joanna next week to Idaho. Um, so that, that's the power, I think, that you guys have really created. You've created such synergy up there. And really, it was a powerful event. I mean, I left there mm -hmm. most of the time you go to an event. And when you can leave inspired and motivated, that's how I left. So you guys, um, it was it was a great event. And I can't say enough good things about it. But um, I want to shift uh, maybe to, I saw a conversation going on with uh, Tanya Plummer um, from Montana. And Tanya, would you like to make your comments that you had um, put in the chat there? I think that'd be a good conversation. Well, I think um, Tani said it really well. I think we were tracking really in alignment with each other. Um, just that when it comes to um, the fear that there's going to be not enough lender security, I, I just, I truly feel like that is inflated and not based on, on data. And so I really think it's worth a harder look at how successful the pilot project has been with Mazaska and Four Bands um, in South Dakota at the very uh, tiny amount of, or, or, or non-existence even of default. Um, and I think there needs to be a way to apply credit to the relationship-based approach that CDFI, native CDFIs have in their communities for, for pre-purchase um, education and relationship, and then also for post-purchase education and relationship. That's a unique element that native CDFIs can deploy that you don't see in other areas where they are closing the loan, selling the loan to an investor, it goes off to the secondary market and, and the relationship is gone. Um, that is not the model that we deploy and there needs to be somehow credit given to that and uh, that recognized in the, con the conversation of lender, secu lender security. Um, sec and, and Dave made some good comments and I'll let him talk too, but you know they don't know because they don't know. We don't do it enough. We can't do it enough because nobody's really been at the table. And so it's almost like, have you ever seen somebody like standing on a diving board and getting ready to jump and they're just really nervous and, and, and they don't wanna jump and they're afraid of what might happen. And then when you zoom out and you look at the picture, the water's like two feet deep, you know? And there really isn't the risk there. And so I, I think this situation is really similar to that. Um, just a note too, that Fort Belknap is also looking at, um, and we have the code written in our conversations with um, the GSEs about that and others about how it could be used, uh, but a deed of trust code, as opposed to a leasehold mortgage code. Um, a deed of trust is acknowledged within the Bureau of Indian Affairs processes. Um, it's what's used by almost every other state, um, save Hawaii. Um, and, and the difference really is only that in the event of foreclosure, uh, unlike the event, the, the uh, recovery would take place at a short sale at the tribal land office and completely bypass the tribal court system. You know, the lender would still follow RESPA guidelines for notice as they're required to do, but uh, it's just much quicker, much easier, much simpler, um, and hasn't been really been used yet, so. Yeah, Holiday, I think you're still there. I see you back there. But, uh, you know, my suggestion would be that you're not talking to, to the people that are high enough in the uh, hierarchy there at the bank. You're talking to, you know, a lender who's getting his direction from headquarters who are saying, you know, we've got some investor overlays here um, that don't allow us to do this. Um, That's not it, Dave. That's not it. It's our, it's our Office of General Counsel and the regulations related to the structure of, of the legal codes. Um, all I can tell you all day is that at the end of the day, we do mortgages all day long. Um, and we've got a 0% default rate. 
And it really is relationships, right? Here in New Mexico, it might be even a little harder than other reservations because we've got what are essentially functional theocracies. We don't have, you know, elected officials and others. The, the, the decisions get made in the Kiva. So we've got traditional law to deal with. We've got federal law to deal with. And we've got tribal codes to deal with. And again, it comes down to the relationship. You know, these homes and the land or, you know, is not going to get put in jeopardy. And so there is that first right of refusal. Uh, there is also that really diligent underwriting that we do. Uh, so to a certain degree, you could say we're, we're not doing a good enough job because we don't have a loss rate, right? We're not taking enough risk. Um, we're kind of taking the best borrowers possible. Um, and we underwrite it fully, fully and it's collateralized with a leasehold interest. We don't do unsecured debt. So they're very secure deals. And again, we do it all day long. It's, it's about the relationships. It's about being able to kind of pick, pick up the phone or go down to tribal council, talk with the administrator, talk with council member or leader or others um, and, and resolve the issue. But if the bank isn't there, if the bank doesn't have the relationship, if, if you know, the, the state office, uh, you know, I, I talked to someone from the state one time we were at a conference. They said, you know, I've, I've lived here my whole life and I've never been to the X reservation, you know, I was like, well, how can that be? You know, you don't have the relationship. So I, I think that's a big part of it. it you're missing it. You're, you're missing what I'm saying. We're making I, I more news all day long. You're not. Right? <laughs> We're, I'm not really talking about the banks so much. Uh, I'm talking about the RD regulations that prevent us from making loans where there is not sufficient um, streamlining of the foreclosure process and where you have things like a one-year redemptive uh, redemption period where the tenant can the borrower can stay in the property for one full year until the day before that year is up he can just pay uh, what was paid at the foreclosure sale and and retain the property and that you know our office of general counsel looks at that and says that's just not acceptable to us I I've submitted the codes. I'm not on the housing staff, by the way. I'm, I'm a generalist. I'm, I don't make the decisions whether or not to um, deny or approve a 502. I, I would love uh, to approve many, many more, but um, our internal staffing feels that it's not legal for us to make loans uh, under the conditions that exist here uh, with the tribal codes. I, I can show you, um, well, I can't show you, but here is, you see this? Mandatory revisions to the Spirit Lake Law and Order Code. This came from the Office of General Counsel. I submitted their, their laws. And uh, <laughs> this is what I got, a multi-page uh, description of those mandatory revisions that need to be done before we are allowed to make um, 502 loans at Spirit Lake, for instance. And the same problem exists at Standing Rock and Turtle Mountain. And it's not <laughs> that we don't have relationships. We have great relationships. Our, our financial uh, institutions will not, they will not go, even though, you know, there are, um, the things that you're talking about, but we systemically are not permitted to make these loans, basically. Do you understand? Yeah, I mean, I understand why it's so important to get the 502 direct loan program made permanent for Native America, because we can get the job done. I, I know. I, You know, the other problem, I don't have any native C rural CDFIs up here anymore. Uh, I was hoping that the uh, this pilot program could be expanded to CDCs or even housing authorities, native housing authorities, but still the problem exists. I, I've got code language that prohibits us from going forward with the loan. So it's very frustrating. It, it's just totally frustrating. I've sat down, I've, I've shown the one-stop document, mortgage document, which, you know, that was accepted by the tribes, then um, this problem wouldn't exist. It would be, it would, you know, um, but they routinely reject that. So 
And, and I appreciate that. I, I respect the tribes. I'm not trying to impose anything upon them at all. I'm just trying to find a way through this barrier that exists and has been existing. And, you know, I hate to see, I think it's counterproductive for us to take applications in Indian country now. I think it does more harm than good. It's just a charade that we go through, you know, it's just a show. We don't really uh, approve anything. We just, uh, everything's denied. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things the CDFIs do up down in South Dakota is you've got home buyer counseling and financial literacy and uh, credit counseling. I think all of those things really help. And our office, our rural development office, it doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, Anyway, Joanna, I'm sorry to have uh, gone on and on about it. I this is where I'm at. This is the blockade that I'm dealing with. And just just last word on that. You know, I appreciate the transparency, the honesty, kind of the the obvious frustration and and the history there. I had a chief credit officer for a lender once tell me, Dave, I just did 100 million in deals for our organization, and my executive wants me to do somersaults to try to get 2.5 million deployed in any country. So tell me how that makes sense. Like my team doesn't want to learn the program. Just let us do what we know how to do well. And so I think the conversation from there, that's great. You know, thanks for being so honest about that. You know, so we could do what we do well. You could do what you do well. And we could meet in the middle. Um, and I had another lender tell me something similar way, way back. He said, tell me why I would go through the brain damage of doing a deal in the Indian country when I could get what I need from OCC by serving Hispanics or Blacks. Again, really, really honest. Uh, saying, okay, well, if you're, if you can't, or you, you, you won't, then we'll do it. And then we can partner on other things. So maybe that's where we're at, but thanks. Thanks holiday. Thanks for, thanks for speaking up. Joanna, uh, Tani and Stephanie, do you guys have any advice there? Well, I think Kathleen Williams from Montana put in the chat. She's the state director in Montana, and they've had some similar challenges with some of the tribes in Montana. Um, Kathleen said that well, I don't know, Kathleen, if you want to come off mute and just quickly mention if she's. Yeah, if she um, so we're, you know, we're trying to pave the path with OGC and, um, and I have a, a, a wonderful housing director who, you know, really wants to break this barrier. So I'm all about, I'm a former um, legislator and I'm all about okay, let's figure this out. So we just got a response from OGC listing out concerns. I mean, I don't know if, if in the past we've done, or OGC has done anything as sort of sweeping as what Holiday held up there. Um, but it, I need to learn more, but as I understand it, it may be a question of the state director taking the risk. Um, and then understanding what that risk is. And, and so that's where my mind is at right now is working with Katina, who's also on this call, my housing director. And we've got a great OGC person and, and Ted's been involved in these conversations. So, mm -hmm. so let's just figure out, well, how concerning are the concerns? And if it's me making a decision, you know, what, how risky is it and how, you know, how can we minimize the risk? So um, just maybe I'll hit a brick wall, but um, but not so, so far. And I'm going to keep keep drilling at it. So. Thank you. Kristen? Yeah, well, we are at the close of our hour, but I didn't want to leave without, first of all, acknowledging that it sounds like there's going to be continued challenges with this, uh, with providing housing and trust land for sure. Um, we'll continue to have these conversations and create space where these conversations can happen. Um, but I also would like to close on, you know, the, the fact that this, the pilot project was so successful and that there's momentum around continuing this. And um, I wanted to invite Joanna or Stephanie or Tani to just share like, what's the next step? What can be done? I know co-sponsorship is needed um, for these bills and we've got some materials, but if one of you want to jump in and just say like, what's the charge here? What, where do we leave with today? Well, I think, and thank you for that, Kristen, but um, I think Joanna has already said it. I mean, it is just seeing this 
uh, past the finish, reach the finish line finally on this 502. And so it is co-sponsors and lifting it up to everybody you know and stuff. But the truth is, and I shoot, I also wanted to just lift up how this is a model. And I know we touched on it just a little bit, but um, to also keep in mind that we're gonna be using this same relending model for the Native American Direct Loan um, Improvement Act, and that is Senate Bill 4505. Um, and so we've got, thank you, Tanya, specifically for helping us get Tester on board. We've got Cinder Rounds and Tester there. But um, yeah, we can't forget about getting this one across the finish line. But know that this has been such a hugely successful model that it is going to be replicated in, in areas where we can help our Native American veterans achieve homeownership, too, on trust land. That's great. And I know that um, there's been a couple of, if, if folks are ready, they want to get in touch with their representatives and, and request some co-sponsorship. I know that there's um, there are a couple of template letters out there that um, we can share out. So I, I think there's one, um, Joanna, you sent me the one for the Native Rural Homeownership Act. And I think Dave Castillo, you have one related to um, the veterans group. So I don't have a link to that one, but I'm gonna post the one for the other here. And I also posted a bill overview for all of you to take a look. And um, yeah, so I don't know if you, if either of you wanna chat about that for just a moment as we close out, um, but those resources are available for everyone. Thanks, Kristen. I would just add quickly that um, it's the legislative level, we need the co-sponsorship for the, for the bill for 502 relending. Um, on the regulatory level, as Holiday has pointed out, there's still a lot of glitches with just the basic 502 direct program. So before it's now's the time to get those sorted out. Thank you, Kathleen, for your leadership in, in, in Montana. And I would say any other native CDFIs, if you're having challenges in your state, let us know because let, let um, Ted Bulo and his team know because now's the time to work out those glitches and build those relationships and um, take advantage of the, the the fa fabulous um, rural development state directors that have, um, are, are just coming into their, their new role because um, it sounds like they're really committed to this work. Um, so legislative level, regulatory level, and you know, the, on, the, on the local level with your tribal leaders, make sure that you know, your codes are um, provide the native CDFIs the protection and that should be enough to provide our RD the protection as well. So thank you guys for the opportunity to share the work. Hey, Pete, Kristen, Ian, uh, just I know there's other webinars coming up, but please don't forget FHFA folks and CRA comments on those are both due. Uh, if you want copies of our comments, let us know. Uh, obviously, mine are pretty pointed as usual, uh, but uh, if there's a, a more diplomatic template out there, that might be good. Yep. And Dave, that you're aware of our webinar that we're having on the 25th. Okay. Yeah, I got you. All right, good. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and close here. Um, nothing like being on the hot seat today. Our facilitator had a medical emergency and our air conditioning quit running here in our building. So as soon as I'm done here, I'm headed out. It's like 93 degrees. And um, I feel you, Pete. Same thing here. Yeah. <laughs> I've been 20 over here, so no complaining, yeah. folks. Uh, yeah, we probably couldn't complain with you down in the Southwest there. <laughs> but, but yeah, I appreciate the, all the work that you guys are doing and allowing us to be able to share that with, you know, to get uh, this a permanent um, resource for native CDFI. So I thank you, Joanna, Connie, Stephanie, Lakota, all the hard work and everyone else that's supporting it. So I truly appreciate it. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Right. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.